The Dauntless Admiral Cistern puts down the report of his newest soldier, Jasper Blue. A childish joke brought about his name, but what he had done was impressive. Managing to make peaceful contact and get a proper overview of the political scene of the world within eight days while also adjusting to a new body and a, an entirely unknown situation. Impressive. The door opens and the savory smell of coffee wafts over. Hello, Philip I. When he looks up, it's a cardboard cut out of Philip with a tray that has both the coffee and a folder inexplicably balanced on it in front of him. He looks over his right shoulder to find the man there giving him an odd look. I appreciate that you're keeping your skills of misdirection and subterfuge sharp, but is this really necessary? Is what necessary, sir? The cutout asks, and Admiral Cistern turns to see that Philip is where the cutout was, and he turns back to find that the cut out where Philip was. All right, that's it. You are now under direct orders to tell me how you compromised my office to such a degree. He snarls in rage. Very well, sir, Philip says as he places the coffee and the folder on the desk, then claps his hands. There's a thud behind Admiral Cistern, and he glances back to see a second Philip and a few other men he recognizes from the intelligence division. The second reaches up and removes his nose to reveal a smaller one beneath before pulling out a handkerchief to wipe off the simulated wrinkles and liver spots. He turns back as the false Philip peels off a fake scalp with the hairline receding to reveal very short cropped hair with a brown hue. Well done, and as I said, I do appreciate that you're trying to keep us all on our toes and how it's not interfered with your service but I must know how you're choosing your recruits. I understand that these men are from the intelligence division, but I know for a fact that only one of them has ever served as a field agent and the other three are exclusively data clerks and code breakers. Simply put, sir, I'm recruiting talent where I find it. Those that get ahead of my shenanigans without blatantly cheating with axiom use are quickly recruited in. A talent for slate of hand, deception, and subversion are to be encouraged, especially in a galaxy where everyone's solution to every problem is throw axiom at its having skills they do not expect or fully comprehend will allow us numerous advantages. Of course, the downside is that it takes considerably longer to train up the skills and capacities, whereas axiom use is a few moments of concentration. I assume that these teachings are also going to your apprentices. Indeed, sir. Very well. Now what have you brought me? A wondrous drink brewed from ground beans that pairs well with a large number of... Sir Philip trails off as Admiral Cistern looks up with a cocked eyebrow. We have drawn up all the information related to Lacran, or rather Planet V6, to 1395. It has not been officially christened in the galactic scale of things, but is likely to be granted the name the natives use. It's in use enough to not raise eyebrows and is far enough from the nearest Lacron that there will not be anything more than token protests at most. I see, Admiral Cistern says, taking the folder as Sir Philip's assistants all salute him and leave the office via the door no doubt greatly confusing the secretary, especially as there are two cardboard cutouts of Sir Philip with them. The rumors spreading should be rather amusing. To summarize, Sir, a colony vessel was sent 1,246 years ago. It was reported lost with all hands unaccounted for and then was swept away. No rescue arrived, and it was assumed that a pirate base or an unexpected mechanical failure destroyed the vessel. Sabotage was also considered. I'm afraid that not much else is known as the records are extremely old and only a passing effort was made into preserving them. I see, Admiral Cistern remarks as he quickly sifts through it. So, I'm going to assume that the reason why there are no men on the world is because they were within this specialized pod on the ship. This man's deck. Is this a nickname or the actual title for this portion of a ship? A bit of both. It was called a 
preservation deck initially, but its nickname has been used in official correspondences so often that blueprints will simply call the preservation deck the man's deck. I see. That's an interesting thing of note. I wonder what occurred to take out the preservation deck on the original colony race. From what I'm reading, it should have been the portion of the ship that survived with the least amount of issue. Admiral Cistern notes comfortably. Something to have Sergeant Blue the second look into? Possibly. He's already befriended an order of scholars, so they may have some idea. Admiral Cistern remarks before taking a sip of coffee. Which leads to what is to be done with this world. It's registered as a danger zone, meaning technically up for registration. No mining company or colonization effort will go near it until it's been properly rescouted. It simply hasn't happened yet as the galaxy moves very slowly, Sir Philip explains and Admiral Sister nods, which means that we could likely take it for ourselves completely legally. No fuss, no muss, rescue the descendants of the initial colony, claim the world for our own and get started on the infrastructure with a grateful populace there to help out. Sergeant Jasper Blue has reported numerous warrior societies and such that would make excellent soldiers, and if not, they would be prime learning material. Sir Philip explains, and Admiral Sister nods once more. Yes, the sad thing is that not all warriors make good soldiers. Admiral Sister remarks, I think we will be laying a claim on the world. No one's touched it and having it called Lacrin will ease things, I believe. Which leads to the question of if we will get there in time to decide the government rather than stumble upon an Emperor Blue, Sir Philip says, and Cistern nearly snorts into his coffee. True enough. From what I understand, he's already potentially the head of the martial branch of the Star Seekers. There might not be a way to get there fast enough to stop him from being king by his own hand. Admiral Cistern quotes, and Sir Philip chuckles lightly. I didn't know you were a fan of Conan the Barbarian. I'm not, however. I've spent a great deal of time with the Nerd Squad, if you'll recall. They are fans of just about everything, Sir Philip remarks. I've become quite adept in the language of L33T and Nerd both. The sheer tartness in his voice brings up a chuckle from Admiral Cistern, and he nods while thinking. So what we need is more than the small rescue we had planned, but what's effectively a colony ship in order to set up all the infrastructure and defenses a colony world needs, not to mention the teaching materials and such required for an uplift, granted not a difficult one as they still speak galactic trade and have some cultural recollection of being colonists. It will be an interesting balancing act in order to keep ourselves from accidentally being labeled as gods of some kind. Although from my own understanding of the documents, there are two organizations we can use to streamline all of this if we approach them properly. The Star Seekers are all but on board already from my understanding. However, there's still an opportunity to speak with the Grand Midwives. One of their higher-ranked paladins is already nearby our sergeant on the field, and he's tried to speak with her multiple times. Wasn't she hostile? Admiral Cistern asks. Yes, but that doesn't mean she will stay hostile. Besides, with a bit of guidance, we could turn her hostility to our advantage. Hmm. Sergeant Blue does not have that form of training. I will have to ensure he has some guidance, if not is... Oh, oh, that is an idea, Sir Philip says, and Admiral Cistern gestures for him to speak further. Simply put, sir, if it becomes known that he's taking orders from whomever is on the other side of the beacon we've gotten to him, then we can directly manipulate the political side of things with the beacon itself, which would lead to the beacon being put at risk by more irrational individuals or it being stolen outright, Admiral Cistern remarks. Hmm, a fair point, sir. Perhaps it would best be used to simply clarify things. Regardless, I'll put things in order so that at a request it can reach me as needed, Sir Philip says, and Admiral Cistern gives him a stern look. Just remember that Sergeant Blue hasn't been trained to keep pace with your shenanigans, and 
likely is undergoing what must truly be a record-setting case of body dysmorphia due to his circumstances, Admiral Cistern warns him. Of course, sir. Never fear, I have no intention of starting things I cannot finish or, at the very least, control. In truth, my main goal is to explain things in a manner more diplomatic than Sergeant Blue has likely attempted. Nothing more. Very good. Is there anything else before I dedicate the next hour and a half to absorbing all this information? Admiral Cistern asks, and Sir Philip nods. By all means, tell me. There have been some inquiries as to what we're doing with the sudden draining of the local axiom when Sergeant Horace Blue sent Sergeant Jasper Blue the beacon. Shall we continue to deflect, lie, or simply let them choke on the truth, sir? I'm assuming that more people will be asking me personally. Otherwise, you would have already appropriately dealt with this? Admiral Cistern asks and receives a nod. Just tell me which is the best of the three options and do so. This is your speciality, Sir Philip. I won't pretend to be the wiser party here. I did say, choke on the truth. The story is delightfully absurd despite being completely accurate and is likely to serve as wonderful obfuscation to both make our word more trustworthy and will serve a great deal to distract the more slander-prone parties. Excellent. No easier lie than the truth. I'm glad it's so easy this time, Admiral Cistern says, and Sir Philip nods with a smile. Very good, sir. I'll inform the rest of my department what we need to do then. Sir Philip says with a nod to Admiral Cistern, who returns it. Admiral Cistern starts reading and then quickly puts down the folder, expecting Sir Philip to already be gone. Not this time, sir. If I do so every time, then it becomes predictable. Sir Philip remarks, having not moved an inch. Admiral Cistern gives a slight chuckle and the proper old man is gone when he opens his eyes again. He's far from surprised. Trying to be unpredictable is just as predictable as being predictable Sir Philip. Admiral Cistern remarks calmly as he starts to read. After a time, he approaches the sheer scale of the political bomb that's been set up, which leaves the question on how best to disarm it. Simply showing up with sperm donations from the men to help give them a healthy male population on top of their robust female one will simply remove the last real limit between an entire planet and war. He will need to get a level of influence into all the governments. Bribery, blackmail, and possible assassination will be needed on a large scale in order to prevent war. But should it be prevented? How many of the governments are even stable outside the Grand Midwives keeping them all from falling apart? For all he knows, there may be one or multiple countries that would have been devoured alive with civil or foreign war if not for the Midwives, and if that's the case, should such a policy be allowed to keep itself in power? Then that leads to the not-so-fun idea of propaganda— and how much of the information is actually true and what's just some sheer nonsense brought up by enemy agents. Rumors and hearsay can be a good source of information, but all of it is suspect. He will have to push forward carefully.